Hey, welcome to the podcast. I have a guest with me today, and I'm not going to introduce the guest. I'm not being rude. I'm just going to ask our guests to introduce themselves. So go ahead, guest. Please introduce yourself. Well, hello. My name's Matt. Um, I run an agency called Chick Digital, um, and basically we're a, a development agency, and we work with mainly small and medium businesses and help them make the most out of the technical landscape basically look work with them to find ways that they can exploit um or take advantage of all of this new technology that's all around us all of the time excellent so the reason i want to speak to you today um you won't have had it yet because it's not published yet but by the time this episode goes out it will be i for the first episode i interviewed a gentleman called norman sanders and he introduced computer aided design to boeing in the 1950s and there was some resistance and I wanted to speak to you because I know that one of your specialist topics is AI. And at the moment in the world of SEO, everyone's wetting their knickers over AI, basically. I can't think of a better way to put it, really. Um, th there's lots of what I think might be unfounded fears. So because I'm not the expert on AI, I thought the very fact that you run a dev agency that helps people get the most out of tech, you'd be a good person to speak to about it. So everyone has their own different definition of AI. So the one that everyone in the world of SEO is panicking about at the moment is that they might be an AI where you can press a button and it will generate thousands of articles that will then, you know, wash over Google like some torrent of silage or sewage or something. But that that's not my definition at the moment. I haven't really formed one. So Matt, what's your definition of AI in, in the context of your, well, your working life? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a really interesting question because to some extent I just see AI as the latest evolution on the the kind of technical um, evolution of man, for want of a better word. I mean, if, wow. you, if you look, go back to, you know, the Industrial Revolution, all of these things, it ultimately all comes back to sort of automating tasks and, and automating ways of working and the kind of, uh, you know, you see the resistance at every single stage in, in human history in, in terms of, you know, you had the Luddites, you know, a lot of resistance to, um, or a lot of firms who didn't know how to handle the internet or how to cope with it. And, you know, a lot of businesses went out of business in the long run just because they never really got a handle on how to, to work differently in a digital world. Um, so, I mean, in terms of, AI um, and, and what I sort of consider it, I basically consider it anything where you are leaving the computer to make judgments for you or to get answers for you. Um, so, I mean, we've had things like big data for years and that, that was, you know, basically um, it, AI is an extension of that, whereas with big data, we were pulling information together to try to try to get answers this is actually giving you the answers so it's a little bit like um the example i always use is uh is apple so or music more specifically which i know is something that you you like but um if you go back along you know we used to have records then we had tapes then we had cds and then along came um along came Apple and allowed you to save all of your stuff onto your computer. And to begin with, that was great because it was all there. You could search for it. Um, and now as it's evolved and, and Spotify there, it's actually telling you what you want to be listening to. And it knows better than you do what you want to be listening to. And I think that's really where the evolution um, basically it's from being big data which is, you know, big data, all of your files are available, all of your music is available in one place, to actually artificial intelligence is, is actually using that information to make recommendations and to, to change people's behaviours without a human sitting there driving that. That, that's, there's several things I'd, I'd like to unpack in that. I think that you've you've covered quite a lot of ground in quite a short time there. There's the yeah. first element about being left behind. So the Luddites, were they the people who were smashing the, the mills? Yeah, yeah, ex exactly yeah. that. So, yeah. So, so, industrial revolution, jobs that took, you know, whole towns of people with a needle and thread could mm. suddenly be done by large machines in, um, 
in mills. So some people, the Luddites, went out and smashed it. I'm I'm very hazy on that that period of history, but is that roughly the right thing? Yeah, I mean, I'm no um, no massive historian, but broadly speaking, that's yeah my understanding of how it how it went down. That that angle's interesting to me because there's there's a slightly cliched argument that you shouldn't allow people to use diggers on building sites. The argument being that one digger takes away the job of 20 people with shovels. But yeah. then perhaps you shouldn't use shovels on a building site. You should use teaspoons because those 10 shovels take <laughs> away the job of 200 people with teaspoons. Now, those 200 people with teaspoons have put 1,000 people with toothpicks out of work. And, you know, it's 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 an inevitable moving forward, like a, you know, a, a, a tide pushing into a, a shoreline as yeah. technology advances. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's an interesting analogy. I mean, w- one of my theories on this is that this change isn't a new thing. You know, we, we didn't look at the news in January, 2023 and say, oh my God, look at this AI thing. It, it's just that it's almost like some brands have managed to coalesce it into a thing. They've branded it mm. as much as the internet initially was very disparate until people like AOL came together and said, right, we're going to take all these elements that are sort of existing anyway, and we're going to, we're going to trash it with capitalism <laughs> or, or, or whatever. Uh, what, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I, I think, I think there's definitely an element of like, of branding things. It's like, um, I was liken it to uh, when we had the big sort of craft beer explosion. Um, you'd notice that you'd go into the shop and all of a sudden beers that have been there for, for years had suddenly been rebranded to make mm. them look like crafty. So all of a sudden now, you know, pedigree suddenly looks like it's been made by a hipster, whereas, you know, <laughs> it's exactly the same beer that, that people have been drinking for 100 years. So um, I think there's an element of that where people realise that it's a buzzword and when a buzzword comes around, it's a good way of unlocking um, <laughs> unlocking spend from people because they feel it's something they should be doing so a lot of people you know it's not so much the the case now but always used to be easier to get money out of people if it was for something digital than rather than something it based because it felt people felt like it was the way to go and I, i think you're right i think it's um it's true with where people have started to brand it and people have started to talk about it. You know, I think in the Reith lectures last year, they had a series of conversations around um, AI and it being, you know, one of the the, the big aspects in human history. Um, and I think it's kind of come to the forefront because people are, are bringing it to the forefront. Um, and it, like you say, I think it, it's not, we didn't suddenly wake up and it's there. It's kind of always been there. It's just that I think people, it's just getting more airspace. It's getting more bandwidth from from everybody. And I think also with it, I guess there's a lot of the, one of the interesting things with technology is that, and, and it comes back to your toothpick analogy to some extent, of the the pace of technology out always outstrips the kind of uh, society's ability to actually process what that technology can do and decide how to respond to it. So it's like the legal, you know, the legal frameworks are always well behind where we, you know, need to need to be with it. Um, and also like the kind of ethical, moral sort of compass in terms of as a society deciding if this is something you want. Basically, by the time a society's come to terms with, oh, AI's here, which is probably the moment we're in at the moment that actually, you know, AI's, society's got to the point where, oh, actually, AI's here, it's a real thing, we're going to have to start thinking about what we do about it. The technology's so far advanced that there's no sort of turning back the clock. And, you know, it's exactly the same with the, you know, in the early e-commerce days when they're talking about it's killing the high street. Well, it's killed the high street, and Mm. we still haven't come up with a, a sensible response to it and i guess the advantage so certainly coming back to what you're saying at the beginning like the fears within something like seo the advantage for, for the arbitrators there are really people like google and um, bing and the search engines so to some extent at least you've got there a body that can move quicker than um than like a government can so 
ultimately, you know, the reason that Google's successful is because it gives people the content they want. So if they create a magic SEO button using AI to to create all the content, Google are going to get wise to that and find ways, if they want to stay as a market leader in search, they're going to have to find ways of, of analysing uh, analyzing that and responding to that so the best quality results still come top and the ones that are, are right. And I think that's, you know... We've had spam articles for forever, you know, if we're talking about the volume that that's now going to bring up. and But it's obviously could have increased through AI, but you've got a better arbitrator, not necessarily morally better, but certainly they've got the, the skills and the understanding to be able to respond to respond to the changes, whereas in other areas of society, AI... Our, our, our way of handling it, like when you look at things like deep fake and all of this kind of stuff, we're so far off of actually getting to grips with what we're likely to be able to do with, um, you know, likely to be able to legislate about any of that. But really, it's that's where I think the bits that are, are, are really where I have some apprehension <laughs> around the use of AI. I think within a business context, it's, it's broadly. Um, it's broadly right, and I think broadly we'll have to get used to it and evolve like we have with all the other technological advances. Yeah, and we, as you mentioned, the the e-commerce and and the high street, it it certainly has killed the high street in a lot of places. But there are a lot of places. Bury St Edmunds near us, um, we're both in Suffolk in the UK, still has a really nice collection of shops. So does Norwich. A lot of places do. Places like Ipswich are dead. Mm. And what surprises me about that is it's the large brands that either didn't embrace the shift to online. I mean, huge brands like Debenhams, mm. Phoenix, there's there's loads. I'm not going to start listing places that don't exist anymore. Um, <laughs> that they, they didn't shift fast enough, but it appears to have been the smaller places that perhaps have more flexibility that embrace that te- technology that are still there. I mean, I had a record shop in about 2004 and we had an online store because I'm a tech and I, I do SEO, I, I could embrace that. But I think the fact that there's more boutique shops now is a sign that when technology like this comes along, some people will just run from it and say, you know, I'm not changing. And those people, unfortunately, tend to fall by the wayside. There's the people who embrace, you know, run face first into everything, which which I think I'm sometimes guilty of. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. But then there's also the people who, who, because this tech has been around for a while now, I'm talking about the internet, because this tech's been around for a while now, there are people who will listen. And perhaps a lot of business owners have now spotted the warning signs or the opportunities. You know, I don't want this to be a, a fully negative thing. And, you know, it's quite normal now for, for example, small boutique clothes shops to embrace Instagram or whatever mm. and just see it as a natural part of their business. So yeah, I think I think smaller businesses I think have possibly have a larger opportunity than very large businesses who have to get together a strategy team and, and do all these kind of things. So um, obviously, don't you don't have to give away any of your uh, your your secret work <laughs> that you do at, at, at Chick Digital. But I mean, wh- what's your experience? What size what size businesses do you work with when you when you're doing AI type work? For AI type work, work it does tend to be small small businesses. Um, for exactly the reasons that you're you're talking about, I mean, I think really with any of any new technology, I think you've really got three ways of approaching it. Uh, well, four way. The fourth way is to ignore it, which mm. is what means you end up like Debenhams <laughs> or that that kind of thing. But realistically, you've got to either use it to automate stuff you need to look at your business and see what adds value basically and what doesn't and you can either use strategically you can then make the choice of either we use this technology to automate the things that don't use value so we've got more time to do the things that do you can look at the things that add value and then look to see if the technology can help you to improve that even further or do something even even more our or the final option is that you can pivot completely away from it. But if you pivot completely away from it, you need to actually 
that needs to be a strategic decision and you need to think about what you're going to do because you not using it won't stop other people from using it. And that's, I think, where you get these boutique shops where their internet presence might be very small. It might be quite niche. Um, but they've actually managed to build up uh, build up a successful business based on the opportunities they see in front of them, which is niche, which is personalised service, which is having a human you can talk to. Um, and that, I think, that, that, sorry. That's, so that's an angle that from from you know I'm speaking as an SEO person that's an angle that always really interests me you know, a lot of the research we do when we work with clients is trying to find those gaps and all the time and this goes back 20 years people in business will assume there's no point in doing it because everyone else is doing it or everyone else is doing it better and my goodness SEO <laughs> proves that wrong all the time it, we we're the we're still the giant killers and I think that long may that continue that, you know, you can start any business. And if you do SEO as a part of many, many, many other things, you can, you can still dominate fairly yeah. swiftly. And I, I see the kind of AI tools you're talking about as just being a part of that, that process, you know, let, let's, what can we do to make things faster? So in AI, uh, sorry, in SEO, for example, if we're going to write an article, we'll use various SEO tools to make sure there's an appetite for that article. So can you give us a real world example of, of where a project you've done where you've brought extra value and a higher level of automation to a process that has helped move a client forward? Yeah, yeah, of course. So I think um as as I mentioned, we, we tend to we tend to approach AI, we, we call it accessible AI, with the idea that at the moment only fifteen percent of businesses are using AI. Um, and that's mainly um, because most of the small businesses aren't. When you look at the large businesses, they're spending big money on AI. It's part of the, the you know, the, the big teams that are sitting around drawing up strategies, integrating it, doing all of that kind of stuff. Whereas I think with small businesses, they, they've they got the barriers there that stop them. They don't have the skills, they don't have the money for the huge great projects and I think what we've tried to focus on on people is how you can actually use AI without it having to be this huge life-changing investment and actually just picking some of the some of the technologies or some you know getting people like us to help you with those technologies to actually help automate and understand things better so one of the things we've really focused on um, because we're kind of always quite heavily lent towards data and insight is using um, using that kind of old AI to basically allow us to analyze text data to gain en- insights that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. So, like a couple examples are we worked with a uh, co- copywriting agency and we analyzed the entire website using AI. Um, and we use that to understand things like how easy the text is to read, how easy it is for, um, or what what the key subjects, what are, what's the tone of voice, what personality is coming across in that. And now, if you think about that as a job in a copyright agency, that's a huge task because it's hugely important that your text is consistent and on point and on brand. Um, and obviously, they do loads of work around what they're what their tone of voice should be. And what we were able to do is analyze, you know, in, in within hours, analyze thousands of blog posts and thousands of pages to actually pull out what the content was saying to people, not so much in the text, but in terms of its tone of voice and in terms of how it's going to be perceived and how easy it is to read. And that allows people to understand, actually, are they communicating to their their customers in the way they want to without having to pay somebody to read through a thousand articles um so that's i think a really sort of powerful way where you can i think you know that gives you a bit of both you can automate a task that that takes a long time but you can also quantify to some extent the 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 quality of data so you can make better decisions so you know at this particular um we're able to work with this agency to demonstrate that over time their tone of voice had become more professional, more 
conscientious. Wow. And that was exactly what they were aiming for because they were trying to position themselves as a um, as a copywriter to law firms and a copywriter to accountants and a copywriter to big enterprises that would want to be so they want somebody who's going to be conscientious who's going to have a very professional tone of voice and the last thing you want in that is to find a few blog posts that have got some real neurotic sort of over the top comments that then just completely throw doubt on if someone came across them and throw doubt on actually are these people the right right people and if you think about the volume of content that gets created now actually getting a handle on what your content's saying and how it's saying it is it, it, it is huge but that was something that was relatively accessible and relatively easy to do and relatively affordable um and could be used you know it could be used in seo it could be used internally it could even be used internally on your own like um on your internal comms in larger organizations without having to go through the whole kind of cycle of making something you know, a, a, an embedded program. It literally can be just a case study or, or a research piece that's making use of, of AI. Um, and I think that's a, a way a lot of smaller firms can kind of look to actually get involved in AI, AI for the first time is, is look at what tools are out there, talk to technologists or, or people that might be able to actually take what their challenges are and find innovative ways of solving them with these technologies. You, you've hit on something there, which I think I, I see as a real opportunity in AI. And, and you mentioned earlier about how AI can, can give answers for things faster. And whenever we're looking at large sets of data, be it Google Analytics or, or anything, so I'm just sort of vaguely keeping this on an SEO track. Mm. Um, when, when we look at data, quite often the results we can get from data analysis are restricted by the questions that we can think to ask. Mm. So where I see projects like the one you just discussed as being really interesting and potentially revolutionary is that instead of a data analysis project being an input output thing. So, you know, what questions are we going to input? What's going to come out of it? I'm kind of hoping AI is going to give us the opportunity to pose questions that we might not thought of asking. Is that hopeful or is that, am I sort of no, roughly ballpark there? No, no, I, th I think you're right. So certainly, I mean, with we're kind of on a journey with, a, with our AI products and our AI work in terms of, I think we've worked out that there's a lot of stuff we can do with this and it's finding the best applications and, and working with people to find those. And I think one of the things we're really keen to look at is actually if we were to take data like, um, whether that's transactional data or, or, or um, in your case, looking at um, SEO data or Google Analytics data, is actually the, the bit that's involved in that is, okay, well, this post as well, this post hasn't done so well, this is converted more, this is converted less. And actually, the bit that that data never tells you is, well, is that because of the way it's written? Is that because mm. of the, you know, the actual qualitative facts that... I guess a good a separate out a, a good SEO agency from you know someone churning out just just mindless content is actually that fact of well yeah the, when you write in this tone it actually converts better. I mean um, I saw really wow, interesting. that's really powerful. Yeah, I, and and I think I, I think that's I saw really interesting talk um, recently, and it was talking about um, I guess kind of like persuasive persuasive marketing and persuasive copy and it's all of these things about you know if you write in a particular way you can get a particular result and that we don't get that currently out of google analytics it you know it's we can just see that well this post did well and this post didn't and we can look at maybe some of the factors of all you know the links that were coming into it but we can actually look at the difference between you know, is the reason this article does well because it's actually a really good article and it's actually written nicely and it actually makes the people do what they what you hope they'll, hope they'll well, do. I, I think you've, you've hit upon an example there, and I like talking about content examples because we are, you know, it's one of our specialisms here at uh, SEO. Now, what I really like about that is potentially that copywriting agency could have seen it, seen AI as a threat because 
a, lo- a large part of the skill for a good copywriter is understanding tone and is thinking about how to persuade and, and how to motivate. But instead of saying, oh, no, AI is going to ruin that, they've kind of taken it and said, okay, well, how can we get better faster with mm. the content? And that, yeah, I think that's, I'm not really sort of arriving at a point here other than just to celebrate that. <laughs> I think, you know, that's, that's great. It's kind of saying, what, what makes us unique as humans? What's our human input to this? Mm. And how can we use AI to, to make ourselves more efficient as humans? You're not taking the humans out of the whole process. And I think that that's one of the threats that people misunderstand with AI is that it doesn't tend to replace human beings for everything. It, it's mm. like, owning a dishwasher sometimes yeah you can stand there for 20 minutes and wash up or you can cram everything in the dishwasher and kick the door shut and hope um i was gonna say and hope for the best that that probably gives you more of an insight into how i use dishwashers than anything else <laughs> um but you know it, it's saying right well this one part of it that is is repetitive could probably be not done by a human yeah i think i think you're right and and it also just the 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 scale of that repetitiveness. So, I mean, I know it's so one of the things that we've looked at in that in our copyright example in terms of looking to explore um, is that what what happens, you know, in a big organisation where you've had six different marketing managers, you've had you know twelve different agencies working on different projects. Actually, how consistent is that across all of that? And and mm-hmm. at the moment, normally. Um, you know, if you get an agency in, they'll look at what you've done and have a quick look around your website and probably give you an, you know, they'll do some work around how your um, tone of voice should be. And then moving forward, they'll write in that way. But actually, this opens up a whole new world of possibilities of actually auditing what's there without having to pay somebody to sit there and read it all to say, well, look, you know, we've analysed all of your content for the last... 10 years and there's this weird bit in you know 2016 to 2018 where it's completely off base compared to what everybody you know what all of your other content is or um so you know we need to revisit that because that stuff's still out in the wild and that stuff's still going to be changing opinions of you or similarly using that as a way of validating your work of actually saying well look you know we told you you needed to be more professional in your copy we've now we've been working with you for six months you can see how the tone of voice has improved over that time and how that consistency has happened so it does i, I think it, it it's a tool that you you know you want to use and at the end of the day you can choose how to make the the best out of it and use it but it comes back to your, your digger example of uh, you know, do you really want to be the firm that's known for for digging with spades? Because it's, or do you want to use a digger for some it's of organic. the bigger bits? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or do you want to use a big a digger for some of those those bits? Because that's you know that's a that's a challenge in the crossroads. I guess we're at from a AI perspective of if you're going to keep on digging with spades, you need to sort of explain the explain the benefits and, uh, and hone in on those benefits and, and make sure that your clients see them and, and perceive them and understand them. Um, otherwise, they'll just go and get a digger. So you, you've highlighted something else um, here, and that's the cross-pollination of different disciplines around data because really good things happen in the world as a whole when, when people in different disciplines join together to, to use new technologies. I mean, we're recording video for this. I don't know if we're going to use it or not because um, I don't know, <laughs> just because I don't know. But if anyone is watching the video, they would have seen you said something there and my jaw dropped because you mentioned something in that project that for an SEO agency would be fantastically powerful. We spend a lot of time looking back at, at old content, trying to figure out which bits of content to optimize. And if we're working with a client who has hundreds or even thousands of articles we have certain things we can do very manually like well you know let's let's see which articles have dipped in rankings in the last few years let's see which ones are sort of on the verge of greatness but we can't take tone into account we can't there's loads of things that you've just mentioned that we can't take into account so it still requires a human and it's a laborious process we do it because it's it's really good thing to do but yeah, there's an example of cross-pollination where you're just telling me about this one thing over here and me 
you know, as, as you're a dev, I'm an SEO. Uh, sorry, in SEO. I never like that an SEO thing. Um, just just in discussion for the purpose of this podcast, the cross-pollination of that, I've gone, wow, actually, no, that's really cool. I can see that as being a big advantage. And ultimately, that would give us more time to to spend looking for new opportunities. It's, it's. I don't think we're riding the crest of a wave with technology like AI. I think we're swimming. We're bobbing around, and occasionally we bump into another swimmer and help each other out. That's a weird analogy, isn't it? But... No, I think I know what you I know you mean. And it's actually, we we did a really interesting project with a um, with a, a fashion brand or a, a fragrance brand, basically, and um, it was you know, using content available online to better understand people's that like particular perfumes also like this kind of perfume mm. because, or fragrance. I, uh, I'm not, um, I'm not the greatest with all of the different, um, all of the different smells around. Yeah. All the different smells. <laughs> Crazy I'm, world, I'm, a lot of smells. Yeah. I'm, and, um, and, but there's a huge, um, there's a huge sort of subset of people who, or where well, subset sounds <laughs> sounds wrong, but it's all right. No, we, we're both in tech. We we can break down to unemotional terms when talking yeah. about humans. I mean, unfortunately, <laughs> we have to. <laughs> yeah. So, but there's a huge subset of people who really love fragrances, and you know, can talk about them all day and have opinions. And apparently, even you know, they'll like to to me. I thought there was a world where you got as high as I don't know CK one, and that was like a good. <laughs> good one pinnacle there's a whole, <laughs> yeah there's a whole level above that of stuff where you're getting into sort of four figures for what? a bottle of perfume and or wow. a bottle of aftershave and it's it's amazing you get people who will buy vintage ones um and um but what is really interesting is one of the huge challenges that if you're a perfume brand or if you do that kind of stuff and it's similar with anything is how can you sell something that is sensory online and that's you know other than by price so up until now most sensory stuff like you know i used to work in furniture and people would buy online because it was cheaper than going into a store they'd normally go into the store and sit on a sofa and say yes this is the sofa i want and then go home and try to find it cheaper online um whereas with you know and it, so it might be the case that you smell a perfume you like it you find it cheaper online but if you're actually doing something that isn't just trying to compete on price, how can you get people shopping online for sensory stuff? And and a lot of that comes down to understanding what people are going to like and, and putting them, you know, making sure that experience is, is right. And that's where, again, where AI can can help is that, and big data, so, you know, and this is where all of the lines sort of cross, isn't it? But it's like, actually, if we know that, you know, you really like CK1, there's a pretty good chance you're going to like something else and you know that's where the um that's where the opportunities um you know are in ai for 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 a firm that really is all about the sort of creativity of creating fragrances it is it's the creativity angle of it that, that always interests me there's a, a really famous person in advertising called david ogilvy he he kind of invented the advertising game, as it were, mm. in, in the way we 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 see it today. Uh, he died many, many years ago, and I often think if he could see what we're able to do now, he he would it would kill him. <laughs> no, I mean I'm trying to think of a good way of saying that. Not realised he's already dead. So his yeah. whole principle was learn about your audience. So they had to do that in the you know, 40s and 50s and 60s by doing focus groups, doing test campaigns in newspapers where they couldn't really get any direct feedback. And then the job of the ad copywriter is appeal to the emotions and other less tangible parts of what motivates people to buy. So with your fragrance example, being able to say, hey, Mr. Ogby, you're going to sell a £4,000 bottle of aftershave because we know these people have a pre you know a, a preference for the color purple and it could be absolutely anything couldn't it I, I was trying to think of a really obscure example like these people always scratch their left ear with their right hand or something but it could be <laughs> it, yeah it could be it's... almost anything and that goes back to ai giving you the questions to ask not just yeah. being an input output thing to give you the answers 
yeah, and, and I think also finding correlations that are you weren't expecting and you weren't looking for. Because obviously, you tend to start with a hypothesis, don't you? Of like, I think this page ranked really well because it was, you know, uh, or lots of this page had a good dwell time because it had lots of funny jokes in it or whatever. And um, where, you know, AI can help is it can actually just, it takes out that hypothesis side of it to some extent and actually can find things that you weren't expecting at, at all and that's i mean what we found sort of going back to the, that copywriting example was we just basically just chucked our whole suite of ai tools at it to, to to see what all of them said and then focused in on the bits that were interesting and you know we looked at ease of read and to be honest every single article is easy to read so okay great that we we know that we registered that and move on. But when you got into the personality bit, that was much more interesting because you could see actually how the tone of voice was changing. But we didn't know before we started that what our major findings would be. The first finding might have been, well, here, look, some of your right articles are impossible to read. So <laughs> there's your there's your big. That's a good one to know if you're a copywriting agency, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and but it's so I think it's that with the it's just you can kind of just keep on adding in other checks and other things that you look at to try to understand those opportunities um and you just build up this wealth of data and then the the biggest challenge in some ways is finding ways of um of communicating that data because um it brings back so much information that being ai is normally numerical and well, that that's then another discipline. Um, mm. I, I know a guy um, done bits of work with. Actually, is a guy who invented the invented. He designed the Yesio um, logo. He's a designer, but he's he's a designer of data visualization. Mm. So he takes the kind of data that that your processes would create, and it's his job to make it pretty pictures. He will slam me for saying that because that is a horrible oversimplification but it's kind of true you know it, yeah. it really is it's it's saying here's a phenomenal amount of data make it something i can shout across a room and the person on the other stand side will understand what 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 we've learned mm. i think i think you're you're right i mean we so we've we have um designers who who've, yeah data design whatever you want to call them data visualization people that we use um and to be fair a lot of the input and we, we're quite good at it but a lot of it's come from just experience of working with people who who understand the business a lot of it that sort of stuff comes from the business need of like so one of our, our big clients uh work in the wholesale industry and um i guess their sort of stuff is probably the borderline between big data and, and AI, it's, it's, you know, there's so much data there that although we're not using always AI to analyze it, we do sometimes, just that volume of it, just making it readable is kind of really leveraging the powers of, um, of technology. And I can remember one of the very first meetings we're in and they were saying, well, look, you know, the point of, so we, they, we, we've got these series of dashboards. So there's like 20 dashboards that visualize um, different aspects of a supplier's performance. And I can remember in the first meeting we had about this going back nearly eight years, I think. And they were literally like, well, the point of this page is so that if I am uh, an account manager, I can go in and I can say to somebody on my tablet, turn it around and say, look at this number. I want to talk to you about this number. Mm. And it's that kind of understanding what people are, uh, are looking for and how, what kind of visuals people respond to. And like you say, I mean, it's all really easy to say oh yeah let's just chuck it in a chart put into excel and and do that but the skill involved in in visualizing the data is is huge and i you know that 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 get, getting the charts only really the first step of the journey i mean the mm. stuff that that you guys do and um well we do as well to be fair in seo although from you know very different angles we're only getting business owners and analysts to step one mm. of a long journey you know, I've, I've, I've been in and out of, you know, factory, loads of different places over the years. And factories, there's, there's one factory I went in once. These huge screens. And even when you're up close to them, it was just a lot of graphs. 
I have no idea why they were doing it. I, I, I understood that industry well um, because, like you, we we work in we start working with a client in a new industry. We have we're on a steep learning curve, and I don't know why they were doing it. I was always thinking, well, who's looking at that and making decisions about what happens tomorrow or what's going to happen in five years? Mm. You, you just getting the data is only the start of the journey, really. Yeah, and I think that's what. So one of the, this client that we work with, they are is like part of what, what they're offering is consultancy around utilizing data, and because because of for that very reason of you know the likes of, of of me and you can produce grass for days, but actually it's understanding. Happy to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's that's it's the fun bit to us. It's doesn't it look nice? But I think. Um, yeah, there's them actually working with with the client to actually understand well what is it you what's really important to you because that's a, that's often the thing I see with dashboards is it is that problem of everyone's like well wouldn't it be great if I could see every single thing about my business on one page and it's like well that's great but at what point do you ever sit down and say right today I'm going to review my entire business you know it it doesn't work like that you you want to be looking at, at looking at it in the context of a particular challenge or a particular situation and and like you say the person that's planning what's going to be made to tomorrow isn't going to need the same data as the person who's making sure that all today's tasks are completed Mm. and and you kind of need to um yeah that's often what the what what in the consultancy side, I think it starts at a lot of the time and is that actually who needs to see what information and don't necessarily flood them with other information because that just then people just then just see a page of numbers or a page of graphs and just turn Data off. blindness, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly that, yeah. Um, Matt, this has been really interesting. I just spotted the time. <laughs> we've, we've been talking for a while. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, this is an absolute pleasure. I mean, th- this is... I think I think I'd like to think that we'll look back on conversations like this in five years' time, and we'll either say, "Wow, we did not see it going that way," or we'll be quietly confident that it's not how we react to new technology; it's how we perceive technology as a whole that actually makes the difference. That's my opinion. I'm not thrusting that kind mm, of on yeah, you at all. Fair. So, just for fun, where do you think we'll be in ten years with AI? There's a big saying, isn't it? Is that we overestimate what's going to change in ten years, but underestimate <sighs> what's going to change in five years. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think, I think we're still a way off of having anything serious like you know cars that drive themselves, all of this kind of stuff. I think really what we'll be seeing, certainly in the five year window, is just per, like good quality personalization in lots of aspects of our lives i think is going to be a big part of it um driven by ai i think um also i think we'll probably get more used to some tasks being completely kind of automated and Mm -hmm. um you know ai becoming a way of a way of getting things done remotely so for example um I know like now they've started doing things like using facial recognition on your driver's license against you to see that you're actually who you say you are. And I think there'll be a lot of that kind of stuff that sort of is is probably some of the first ports of call. Um, And I think that's what we'll we'll see a lot of. I, I think actually fundamentally, you know, it's not going to be, that different just probably an extension of what we've seen of more automation more clever ways of doing things of you know breaking down barriers in terms of basically making it easier for people to spend money i think is going to be the <laughs> that, that seems to what, be what drives it it's um so that that's what i i think will happen i'm sure you know like you say look back at this in 10 years and we'll see it's actually you know i'll be sitting there in a the hovercraft <laughs> oh, we were promised one, hover cars many, many years ago. Yeah. Back to the Future. That documentary, Back to the Future, lied to us. Um, <laughs> so, Matt, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed your company. Um, it's been a fascinating chat. So, before we go, how can people find out more about about your business? Yeah, so you can find us on 
chickdigital.co.uk um, or you can look us up on LinkedIn. Um, so I think if you search for me, Matt Chick, or for our Chick Digital on there, you should be able to find us. Um, we're based in Colchester, so if anyone's in Colchester and east of England, so if anyone's around that way, feel free to give us a shout and we can have a coffee. Brilliant. So final thing, I'm going to ask every every guest this, every guest who's a... Um, um, you know, a consultant or or an, an operative. Um, what's your favourite type of project? What's the one that, when it comes in, you think, yes, this is going to be great. This this is this is my thing. This is what I love. At the moment, I, I love anything to do with AI and data. To be honest, um, anything to do with AI and data gets me really interested because I just I, I, I'm one that I've. My, that's just the way my brain works. I, I find content and stuff like that really confusing. And, you know, I kind of first time I got excited about it was when I was able to turn it into numbers <laughs> to say, "Oh, look, <laughs> now I understand it." <laughs> yeah, now that makes sense. So, yeah, anything to do with data always gets me interested because I always think there's so much potential in data, and and AI is just to me an extension of that in a lots of ways because it just helps us analyze and understand that data quicker. But to me, that's also the area where I always think you can have the biggest impact the quickest because so much data isn't used and the possibilities it opens up just by actually understanding what's happening on a day-to-day basis, either in your business or, or in the places you operate, is just huge. So, yeah, definitely um, if uh, yeah anyone that's got any data or data-based projects um not only will i buy you a coffee you might even get a cake as well Ooh. out of that one you you've been i've been making notes throughout this and you said so many quotable things and just there so much data is never used that's just put it on a t-shirt matt just you know, that's <laughs> <laughs> what a great quote that's that's so brilliant okay well um as you probably gathered listeners i could carry on chatting to matt kind of all the rest of the day um but i'm not going to because unfortunately i've got to go and do other things and now i want cake so matt once again thank you ever so much is there any final thoughts or would you just like to say goodbye to to close the show no no that's that's thank you andrew that's no, been really good really enjoyed it and um yeah looking forward to hearing some of the other people in the in the series